if um, there's one thing I've learned in all of these years of publishing, and especially in the last few years that I've known Kevin, is to never let somebody read after him. <laughs> um, thank you, that's just terrific. I, I've listened to that story, I've read it, Fjord of Killary, several times, and, um, and I've heard him read it a couple of times, and I, it just, I laugh every time, about just as hard as the first time, it's just great, so. You know, I'm trying to think of the, the, the sort of diversity of, of readings you gave us, um, and and some trying to you know think to myself what what brings some of them together, and I and and for me it was very much a sense of place in each one, the vividness of place in your writing, whether it's um, you know about the place you actually live, about a place that you've essentially completely imagined out of whole cloth, um, or about a place I guess you've just seen somewhere along the way, um, but even in the essay the you know, the quick thumbnail sketches yeah. that you have of the places that you've lived, whether in Spain or Santa Barbara or whatever, incredibly vivid, and I just wonder if, um, you know, obviously you don't write a sort of pastoral, yeah. and yet, um, <laughs> maybe it's an anti-pastoral, you know, but, uh, but I'm wondering what... We can't what, resist it, though, at some level, Irish yeah, writers. Yeah, you know? well, I was gonna say, I mean, it seems, it seems sort of quintessentially Irish. I wonder if you could talk a bit about, um, um, you know, about how landscape inspires yeah. your work. Yeah, I mean, for a very long while, uh, I used to think that um, my stories and my ideas mainly came in at the ear and that was from speech and talk and, 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 and dialect. And, and I mean, Irish people do love the, the sounds of their own voices and we're good at talk. So, so that is certainly an element. But increasingly now, I think, as, 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 as I go on, I think that most of my stories come from places and, and come from the feeling that you find trapped in each different place you go around to. Um, I have a kind of a strange, slightly esoteric uh, theory about this, and it's about human feeling. I, I, I believe that human feeling doesn't just exist in humans, but I believe that it settles into our places um, and it lingers there and creates a kind of vibration. And as I go around on my bicycle or, or, or drive around the west of Ireland, and, and when I get out of the house, it's important to get out of the house, I think, as a writer, and, and go to places. Very often you tune into these different feelings that a place has. Um, for the story Fjord of Killery, I was, I was on a cycling trip in the west of Ireland, and I, 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 I landed in this hotel lounge bar on a very wet night, and all the locals were lined up against the bar and they were talking exclusively of roads, mileage, and general directions. <laughs> so sometimes you could just get a gift like that, but it, it is the, this kind of feeling of a place that gives you the atmosphere of a story. And I, I believe with short stories in particular that it's a musical form. I think every short story has a melody, or a tune, or a refrain, and you're trying to hear that. Um, so I'm, I'm going around the place and I'm listening. Um, if, you, if, you, you lot, if any of you see me around Santa Fe tomorrow, sitting in a coffee shop or in one of your wonderful craft ale bars, it may look like I'm doing very little. <laughs> but in fact, I'm tuning into the vibrations uh, for, for future reference. Which are uh, significant here, as we know. So. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm curious a little bit more about that, what, what you say about writing by ear. And I, a lot of writers that I work with, um, I think are sort of prose-driven writers, in a way, um, do talk about it that way, that they write by ear. So is that, can you describe that process? I mean, is yeah. that something where the, the event of the story unfolds because of the music of the language, yeah. or how does that work for you? Because obviously there's such an intense lyricism in what you write. Yeah, I, I always remember in my kind of um, early, mid-20s, when, when, when the notion that I was really going to write seriously was kind of sitting in my head. I remember reading an interview with Don DeLillo, one of the very few he gives, and um, I remember he said something that seemed heroic to me as a young zealot writer about to, about to get going. And he said, I'm completely prepared to change the meaning of a sentence for the sake of how it sounds. All I'm really interested in is the sound mm -hmm. and the melody. And I will let that dictate the story and the meaning. And I remember thinking, oh, fuck, that's heroic. You know, that, that, that's, that's absolutely what I want to do. Um, and it's very important to me, I, I perform the stories and the work aloud at home in the barracks in County Sligo. Um, my, my, my then girlfriend from the essay, now wife, says that she can tell it's a good one if, if she can hear me cackling in my... Uh... The neighbors think that 10 people live there. Yeah. But it's just Kevin doing the voices. But, but it's amazing, as a writer, the, the, 
the ear is such a good tool. Um, when you read over your stuff on, 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 on the page, you will glaze over the, 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 the mistakes and, and the kind of um, the places where you're trying to avoid the real, the real stuff. Um, but you're, when you read it aloud, your ear gets it straight away. You know, all the false notes become very, very evident. The places where you're trying to avoid the, 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 the real crux of the story. Um, and it's a peculiar thing what I find when I read over the work now. Very often it's the stuff that kind of embarrasses you. That's the good stuff, you know? Um, at some level, all writers, especially younger ones, kind of trying to sound cool on the page and kind of trying to sound sophisticated and impressive and like, like some sort of existential hero. I know that's what I was trying to do in my Yeah, 20s. I was going to say, was that something you felt like you had to eliminate? I mean, obviously, in a, well, you would probably say that the style doesn't come easy, but it looks like it comes so easy to you. And like, yeah. was that something you felt like you had to eliminate or harness? Or? Yeah, and actually it was, it was learning to use my ear as, as the kind of primary tool in the craft side of things and acting the stories out. Um, you have noticed that I am a frustrated actor uh, very much. Um, yeah, that, 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 that was a critical thing for me. Um, but it took, it, it took me a long while to, to, to put the necessary hours in craft and sweat and tears into it. I didn't publish my first book till I was um, 37, which isn't a spring chicken. Yeah, that Even though the great thing about being a writer in your mid-40s is you're still called a young writer, which is a wonderful thing. And, great, and Kevin's only got the three books so far. <laughs> yeah. so, um, but that's actually interesting. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how you came to writing, because, uh, um, well, or how you came to writing fiction. I imagine you were writing for a while before you yeah. were 37, but you had kind of actually, you know, the conventional American path to writing, to publishing literary fiction is, you know, you graduate college, go to an MFA program, mm -hmm. find your agent, and then find your publisher yeah. and publish in some I've never been in a there. creative writing workshop in my life. <laughs> Why? We got applause for that. Uh, we, we've just, I've, I've, I came up in a very traditional, old fashioned way, like a Damon Runyon kind of way we were saying today. Of, of, uh, I was a journalist and I worked in newspapers and I was a cub reporter. Um, I can date precisely my first short story, which was in, I think, August 8, 1978 because my family and I were on holiday on a small island off the west coast of Ireland, and we were staying in a caravan trailer and on a beach, and we had the radio on late at night, and they broke in Radio Luxembourg halfway through the song and said, ladies and gentlemen, the king is dead. Elvis Presley had departed. And we were all, ah, oh, in a state. And I was so moved by this that I was forced to bring pen to paper the next day. <laughs> and I wrote my first short story, and it was about the soul of Elvis ascending over Memphis and, and, and entering the body of a seagull <laughs> that then crossed the Atlantic and communed with a small ginger Irish child on a beach. Um, I regret to inform you that this story has not survived. Um, but that was my first story. Then I had the classic teenage poetry phase, uh, lying around in, in the graveyard of a cathedral in Limerick. <laughs> wearing all black and, 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 and writing poems about despair. Um, then I came through journalism. Um, and it was a, I was working as a freelance journalist all through my 20s in, in my travels around and in Cork City where I was usually based. And I was doing fine, you know. I was appearing in good newspapers, The Guardian and The Irish Times, making decent money, but I wasn't, I wasn't getting happy. I knew there was a part of my brain that I wasn't really using that I wanted to use. And it's that back part of the brain, the unconscious, because that's where all fiction and, 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 and stories come from. And I think that it, writing fiction, if, it, if, if it's similar to anything else in life, it's, it's, it's similar to dreaming. That's, that's the place you're using, and that's what's giving you the, the ideas. And yet, at the same time, I mean, I think, you know, that stuff we're saying about, you know, writing by ear and sort of following the music of the language to tell you what the story is, and, you know, obviously the kind of lyricism often drives things. I was making light of it, you know, in my introduction about, oh, we don't care about plot at Grey Wolf or whatever, mm -hmm. but, it, but it is a notable thing that you, um, you, you make sure to tell a story. You know, mm -hmm. it's a, a lot of, a lot of your, your stories, however, you know, quote, literary, mm -hmm. are tales in a mm -hmm. way. And I'm wondering, I mean, do you think, um, well, I guess it's two questions. One is, did that sort of journalism practice inform that at mm -hmm. all, do you think? Um, was it something else? And then also, you know, I, you've said a couple of times before, uh, both to me and I think also in interviews that I've read, that you feel like a lot of the work of narrative, of, of storytelling, has um, emigrated to television sure, in, yeah. in a way. And I wonder if the fiction you're writing is in some ways a, a response to that or, yeah. or something else. 
Sure. I mean, Anthony Burgess, who you mentioned earlier, actually the, the great writer, great novelist of A Clockwork Orange and much, much else, said, said always that there were two types of writer. There were the user of language and the storyteller. You know, and I hope I'm both um, in some kind of way. I do like to tell a story. Um, and I think, like, people will talk very often about, about the oral tradition in Irish literature. Um, always has a vaguely pornographic ring to me when I hear that phrase. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I do remember in the 1970s, there were very frequently electricity board strikes in Ireland. And then the electricity would be cut for like a night. The houses would black out. And we would light candles. And the family would tell stories, you know? And we are very gifted storytellers. <laughs> uh, and it is yarn spinning. And the same stories. And even when I go back and visit family now, it's the exact same stories that are told again and again and again. And nobody cares about the fact that they know the story. It's the rendition that counts, how well it's delivered. And in this way, it's like a song. It's like, it's like a musical thing. Um, so that, that's absolutely, in all of us, I think, um, as Irish writers, that, that desire to, to, to tell a story. I mean, Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake are compendiums of, 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 of vast, you know, endless, infinite numbers of stories. And, and, and no matter the style or the intensity of the prose or what's going on with the language, I think we're always inclined to tell stories as well. Um, very interesting that you, you mentioned the TV thing, the, the television thing. I mean, as you do go around and talk to other writers at literary events and festivals, there has been this sense that a lot of the great storytelling heat has moved from the novel and gone into TV. And it certainly is a golden age in, in terms of television drama. In the great box sets that we all watch of The Wire and Mad Men and The Sopranos. And I think it's a really great thing, actually, for young writers to be around now, because for 30 bucks or 40 bucks or whatever a box set costs, you can get this master class in narrative art. You know, how to tell these stories, how, how, how to move in and out of scenes, where to cut. And um, yeah, it, it's a really interesting time to be around. In, and I, I work in scripts as well. Um, it's really interesting to me the way a lot of those TV shows borrow from the novel. Um, David Simon, the creator of The Wire, talks about each season of The Wire being structured like a 19th century Russian novel. We have to do a lot of work in the first couple of episodes, but the, like you do in the first 80 or 90 pages of an old Russian novel, but suddenly something clicks and you're in and you can't let down that book or you're watching another two episodes before you go to bed. Come on, one more, you know? So it's, um, it's really interesting. I do think it's time that the novel starts to steal back from TV and use some of those great narrative techniques that are being honed all the time. And certainly with the City of Bohan novel and, and future novels, that's, that's what I intend or hope to do. Yeah, it had always struck me that um, in some ways, uh, as movies became popularized and stories went there, it seemed to be a sort of parallel to the way, you know, the way the emergence of photography sort of freed up painters sure. to become very abstract, mm. you know, and similarly, I think it, it freed up writers to become maybe quite lyrical or, you know, um, um, and that they've sort of forgotten plot, but, it, you know, you can only blow up the house so many times sure. in abstraction, yeah. so it's nice to kind of yeah. take it back now, and it's a thing that um, mm. Kevin does extraordinarily well, I think, but in, in all of his stories and in yeah. the, uh, the novel. But I am, I, yeah. Yeah, just, uh, just a, a small point. I, I, as a reader, and, and most critically as a writer, what you are also as you're a reader, as a reader, I, I, I never really care if, if something is really traditional or really classical or really avant-garde and really out there. All I'm worried about is good or bad, you know, and, and that's the fundamental thing for me, is this well done? And if it's well done, I'm, I, I, I'm in with it, you know? Yeah, and as another, I've become very ecumenical as I've gotten yeah. older. I say the only <laughs> yeah. thing I, I don't want to be is bored, yeah. you know? And um, I can be bored in a very conventional thing or a very experimental thing, you yeah. know? And so I'm yeah. always curious where the writer gets that tension. And if we, we could talk about Fjord of Killery for a minute, mm. and it's a funny story because, I mean, the only action, per se, is the rain coming down. They move upstairs, you know? It's not a complicated plot, and yet, and the little, but it seems to proceed on the dialogue, which is actually almost a series of non sequiturs. Mm. As you read the story, you're only getting snatches of conversation. Mm. And, it, and it's, um, it's interesting how you kind of can build tension that way. Yeah. Um, um, I, I think um, what a good short story has above all is timing. And, and as a story writer to me, when a story works out, I can never work out how I managed the timing. It's a complete mystery to me. Um, it's very often the case, actually, that a story is about something on the surface, but it's about something else just under the surface of that. And after I'd 
read, or after I'd written and published the story, I was reading it at a small, small event in a, in a library in Kilkenny in Ireland, and it struck me what the story was really about. You know, it's very loud on the surface. It's an apocalypse. It's the end of the world. It's a biblical flood. It's the last night on earth for the Fjord of Killary. But really, underneath the surface, it's just about aging. It's about getting older. It's about this guy growing into his own skin and coming to accept that. And all the locals in the bar, the way they're presented is quite, you know, he, he's quite sniffy about them, really. But it strikes me that all those locals that we hear in their snatches of conversation, they're all quite comfortable in their skins. He's not, you know? And he's suddenly finds himself maturing, I think, with the story. So underneath the surface, it's really a very, a very simple story about, about getting older, yeah. especially going into that early 40s. Kind of period. Time floods o is flooding over him. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's beautiful the way that works. You, it's actually, I love the ending of that story um, because you do kind of drive home this point about sure. the end of his youth and it's coming in this sort of apocalyptic scenario. Mm -hmm. But also, I guess, like a, maybe a moment where this crisis has ended, you yeah. know, I guess, or possibly ended. And I, we were over dinner last night, we were. Um, talking ill of a number of contemporary short story writers, actually, who will go unnamed at the moment. But, we weren't um, bitching. Uh, we yeah, weren't. yeah. But we, were, but we were talking about the endings of stories yeah. and, um, and, and how, how a lot of writers seem to pull back from the endings mm. of their stories. And I was wondering if you could talk about how you go about accelerating or decelerating yeah. as, you, as you approach the end of your stories. And I guess the other question is, is you know, all this talk about sort of writing almost intuitively, do you ever know the ending when you first start writing a story or do you feel your way into yeah. it? Yeah, oh God, endings are a nightmare, you know, for a story writer. Um, it's impossible to say what a good short story is, really, but you know one when you've read one and you know one when you've written one, you know, and you, you know when it's just, it kind of goes ping, it, it's right at the end, and I knew immediately when I finished The Fjord Killary, that's the last line, it's done. My, my work here is done, you know? But yeah, it's, it, the weird thing, the more I write short stories, and, I, and I've been fairly f fervent about the craft now for maybe 15 years. Um, the more I do them, the, the more mysterious they become to me. And it seems like the less I know about them, the closer in you get, the more mysterious it seems. And it's almost like an occult craft. They're very, very difficult. Um, it's the difficulty that attracts me to them. I think in some ways they're closer to music or painting or poetry than they are to the novel. Um, you have so little space in which to get the reader you have to do it inside half a page. You have to hook, stab the reader down onto the page <laughs> inside a half a page, and you can't let them go. And every sentence in a short story is a walk along a tightrope. You know, and, you, and, you, and it can go wrong very, very quickly. Um, I write lots of short stories, and very few of them work out. I probably write 10 or 12 a year, and only one or two will ever get outside the house. <laughs> I have that kind of a strike rate. It's really low. Um, my workspace in County Sligo is littered with these half-dead stories all over the floor. I call them zombie stories. <laughs> and sometimes I take a bit of one and, 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 and try to attach it to a bit of another and see if that works. And my, the, my editor in, in London on the, on the last collection, a very delicate young English chap, said to me distastefully, Kevin, it looks less like writing and more like welding sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it's strange and mysterious. William Trevor, one of the great Irish short story writers, said it's, it's, it's an artisanal craft, and, and the more you do it, the more, the, the, the more adept you will become. I don't think it's any coincidence that the very best story writers alive, people like Lydia Davis or George Saunders or Alice Munro or William Trevor, are writers who continue with the stories all the way through their careers. I hate that phenomenon where you get a brilliant first book of stories, and then the lady or the guy in question just goes on and writes novels after that. I think, no, stick with it. Mm -hmm. it it's a sacred form and, and, and really go with that, you know? And you, now you, um, I know you go through dozens of drafts um, mm. of your stories. Are there, do you find yourself always correcting or addressing the same sorts of problems or is just they creep in in early drafts or is every story really its own problem? Yeah, I've, I've kind of changed in my methods over the last while, I think. I used to kind of work a story through quite slowly, page by page, and I wouldn't go on to the next page until a page felt right. But lately, um, my, my, my method is more so is to write loads and loads and loads, and then cut, 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 cut. Um, the next novel, which is coming towards the end of this year, really slim novel, it's about 50,000 words, but I would estimate that over the last three years, I've written about a quarter of a million words for it, and I've just cut, 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 
And to use a, quite a tired analogy, maybe it is like the sculptor with the block of stone, you know? Mm -hmm. You just put out these first and second drafts where you give yourself material, you give yourself the block of stone, and then you chip, 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 and try to find the shape of the story that's in there. Um, it keeps me off the streets. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to, you know, we haven't talked about Bohan a little bit, which is the, the, you know, the thing that really made you, me find your work and which I love. And you've said that um, when you first started writing it, you didn't know that you were setting it in the future. Mm. Yeah, I was halfway through the, actually I, I knew for a while that I wanted to build a city of my own, build a little city, I, I'm a megalomaniac. And, um, <laughs> but I, 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 I couldn't begin the novel because I didn't know what the place was called. And without lurching into to melodrama, I had a vision. And I, I sat up, bolt upright in the bed one night in County Sligo in a feverish sweat. And I said out, line, out loud, I said, Bohan! And my wife turned and kicked me and said, I oh, want you fucking go back to sleep, please. <laughs> but I had it. I had the word and I began the next day. Um, but yeah, it's... it's, it's, it's um, it's, was, it's, that, was, that, was that realization a, a liberating thing or a constraint that you had to work within? Yeah, it, 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 it's mysterious. I, I, I knew that it was going to be an extremely intense prose performance. I was going to lay it on thick, you know? I was going to put everything down on the page. And I thought, I don't want to spend three years at this. I'll go nuts <laughs> if it's going to be that intense a performance. So I said, do it quick. Um, so the plan was I was going to write it 6,000 words a week, um, 10 weeks. That was it. And I actually managed it, I think, in about 13 weeks. In three months, I got a first draft and then spent about another six months on it. So it was a very quick um, process. Um, I think I was technically insane during the writing of the book. I was living, eating, and breathing the city of Bohan. Um, I knew it was working very quickly because I started to have dreams that were set on the streets there. And I could see the place in perfect detail as, as, I, as I walked around. So I knew, yeah, this is fine. Um, like, I mean, it was my first novel published. It wasn't the first novel I'd written, like so many. They never are. Like yeah, a majority yeah, of novelists, yeah. I think there's always a couple of zombie efforts under the bed at home. Um, and I certainly have a couple of those. But the, if there's a single key trick to the writing life, it's deciding what material should be on your desk at a particular time. And I knew the morning I started Bohan, yeah. I've, 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 I've read enough graphic novels. I've watched enough box sets. I've listened to enough Trojan records, dub reggae. I've seen enough of The Sopranos. I've, I've read enough of Joyce and Beckett and Faulkner and all of those influences on it. I, I have this, this is, this is right, right now, you know? And it, it's difficult. I think often in your 20s, especially, when you're starting out, you're trying to write a novel that you're decades away from being able to do. But the morning I started out, I knew, yeah, this is, this is what's supposed to be on the desk now. And that's the, the critical trick of it, I think, deciding what, what's, what, 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 what's for now. You have to catch it on the fly. You can't save it up for later. I find that with ideas for short stories. Sometimes you put it into the notebook and think, um, OK, I'll write that in six months' time when, when I have the time free on the desk. But it uh, never works out. You have to get it when it's hot, you know? And I find it's a very good sign for a short story if I find myself sneaking it away from what I'm supposed to be doing, whether it's a novel or a script, and kind of going off to have a fling with, the, with, with this story. You know, that's, that's usually a fairly urgent sign that it's a good one, and that's what I should be working at. Now, so then, um, are you, you know, these things grab hold of you. Are you sort of a subscriber to the divine inspiration school of art making, or the get up and go to your work, go yeah. to your work school? Actually, one of the questions I didn't quite get around to was about the influence of journalism. And I think what journalism does do for you is it, 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 it teaches you that you can always write at any time. No matter what condition you're in, no matter how moody or melancholic or, or happy or sad you are, you can always get words down on the page. It takes the kind of preciousness out of it. Um, I think when you're younger, you believe more in the muse. Um, but the muse only comes with work, you know? And I'm a slugger. I go in now. I wasn't disciplined in my 20s. Um, I was on the tiles a lot of the time in, 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 in my 20s. But I'm very, <laughs> I'm very disciplined now. Um, I go into the workroom. In, 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 in the house in Sligo, you know, seven mornings a week for three or four hours, another couple of hours in the evenings. And, I, and, I, and even as I travel around, I, I try to do as much as I can. So I am very disciplined now. Um, but, it, it, you know, it's, 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 it's hard work and it's, it, it's, a, it's a tough job. But 
it kind of sets you free to write fiction, to create, to write narrative fiction, and to write stories. You become a kind of an independent republic of one, and you make the rules, and you're God, and you're the puppet master. And I, I, I try to remember that it's a great privilege to be able to do that work, and, 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 and to not have to leave the house when it's raining outside in County Sligo. And sometimes I, I have a very indulgent wife who even lets me stay in bed and brings me a pot of tea, and I just sit up in the bed and start. You know, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a very privileged position to be in in lots of ways. And, I, and, I, and I, I try to remember that on, on the dreary, dull days when it doesn't seem to be going so well on the page. Well, I think um, this stage is also um, your, your republic, and I think you've brought us to a very lovely end to the evening. So I think I'm going to uh, thank Kevin Barry for um, this extraordinary meeting. And thank, thank you for the Foundation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.